Hi, and uh, welcome to this video where I present our paper, Majority of Three, The Simplest Optimal Learner, that was published at uh, Cold 2024. And this work is joint work with Ishak Aden Ali from UC Berkeley, my PhD student Michael müller husko from Aarhus University, and Nikita Siewotowski, also from UC Berkeley. And a big thanks for Michael uh, for making most of these uh, slides in this presentation. Okay, so, so what's the result and the topic of this work? And uh, so the basic setup that we're looking at is binary classification in the so-called realizable case. Uh, first, I'm just going to give a kind of sketched definition of this setup, and then I'm going to be a little bit more formal uh, afterwards. So basically, we're looking at a learning task, machine learning task, where uh, we have to do binary classification. So for instance, we get pictures of image, we get images of animals, and we have to say whether this is a picture of a mammal or not, right? So there are two classes, yes and no. Now, a learning algorithm in this model here received uh, labeled data. So a bunch of training examples, images here with the correct annotated label, is this a mammal or not? And, and then the goal is for this learning algorithm to output a prediction algorithm, right? Some, some kind of hypothesis, a model that we can use to make future predictions. So it looks something like this. There's a learning algorithm down here and the learning algorithm receives as input these labeled examples. And then it has to choose a prediction algorithm to output, right? So there's a bunch of different algorithms it could choose to produce. It has to produce a prediction algorithm. And this prediction algorithm that it outputs, the idea is that if I feed it some of the training data, and you can see here that it, it produces the correct labels, right? So we can, we can stuff in one of these examples, feed it through the prediction algorithm, and get an output afterwards, a label, right? Good. So in addition to seeing this labeled data, another ingredient in this binary classification setup is that there's a data distribution, so distribution over images of uh, animals. And this data distribution has generated our labeled samples. And uh, furthermore, right, the goal now for this learning algorithm, uh, the prediction algorithm that it outputs uh, should produce correct predictions. And these predictions should be correct under the data distribution that we care about, right? So the goal is that if I get a new element from the same data distribution, then hopefully I will be able to predict its label correctly, right? Good. So let's try to be a little bit more formal here and just introduce some notation. We say in general, there's an input space X. So this could be all the images of animals. There's an output space, zero and one, maybe zero and one in the previous example corresponds to yes and no. There's a learning algorithm, and the learning algorithm is basically just a function, h uh, hat here, that takes in n labeled examples. So an input element and its corresponding label. So it takes in n samples, and it outputs a function, a predictor, that's a function from the input domain x to zeros and ones. And so that's what the learning algorithm is. Then there's this unknown distribution p or x. So this distribution is not known to the learning algorithm. And we're in the so-called realizable case. So what does this mean? It means that in general, our learning algorithm is given access to a hypothesis class or function class H. So this set of all these possible prediction algorithms that we saw before. And this function class has a fixed VC dimension of D. And I'll uh, remind you what that is in just a second. So that's a fixed VC dimension D. And inside of this class is an unknown labeling function, H star. So H star is one of those, uh, basically corresponds to one of those predictions algorithms in here, one of the functions, but we don't know which one it is. And the labeled examples that we see are basically excise, so elements of the input space, along with the correct label, which is what this H star is producing, okay? And the assumption is that all of our training samples XI are drawn independent from this distribution P. Okay, so, so this unknown function that's sitting in here corresponding to one of the prediction algorithms, um, this unknown function uh, is giving us our labels and these are the correct labels. Okay, so the distribution P is really generating all these labeled examples down here. And now the model that we're working on in, in this work here is the so-called prediction model. And what is the goal in the prediction model? So the goal in the prediction model is to, I guess, produce a hypothesis H uh, hat here that has a small error as possible, right? So what is the error of a particular hypothesis or prediction algorithm? 
Well, it's basically just the probability over a fresh sample from the distribution P that your prediction algorithm mispredicts the label of this new sample, right? So that it's different than H star. It would be convenient to, at least for the little bit of proofs that we're going to do, it'll be convenient to, to think of this probability as also the expectation of an indicator random variable that takes the value one whenever uh, your hypothesis H bar of S uh, mispredicts the label. Right, so the subscript S here really denotes that this is really, I guess, the hypothesis or, or prediction algorithm that your learning algorithm is producing on the training set S. Now, the goal now is for your uh, learning algorithm to produce an H hat where the expected error is as small as possible, right? So sometimes you might have seen other models where you want to say with high probability, the error of the hypothesis or prediction algorithm you produce is small. This is, for instance, the pack learning setup. Uh, but here in the prediction model, we just want that the expected error is as small as possible, right? So the expected error over a fresh data set of size n of the error that this new um, hypothesis you, or this prediction algorithm you produce should be as small as possible. Okay, so this is the setup. Okay, so let me go over some of the history of this. So first of all, okay, let's just see what is this VC dimension, just real quick a recap. And so the VC dimension of a hypothesis at H is the D so that uh, there's a set of D samples that can be shattered. So let me define that in a second. And no set of D plus one samples can be shattered. Right. So shattering a set of D samples just means that your hypothesis at H can realize all the two to the D different labeling. Right? So remember it's binary classification, right? So there's two to the D different ways of labeling D, D samples. So let's just have an example here just to make sure the definition is clear. Let's say our input domain X is just R1. So every point, uh, every input element is just a single real number. And let's say our hypothesis set uh, corresponds to all hyperplanes. So on one side of a hyperplane, you say zero, and then on the other side of a hyperplane, you say one. So let's see that we can shatter two points here. So if I want to argue that I can shatter two points, I have to argue that there's a hyperplane that can generate all the four different labelings of these two points. And you can see here, right, indeed, there's a hyperplane for each of these four different labelings. So, so we can, in fact, shatter a set of two points with a hyperplane. And it's not too hard to convince yourself that uh, a set of hyperplanes cannot shatter any set of three points, right? Because if I have three points in R1, I cannot generate the labeling that has a zero on the two outer points and one on the innermost point. Right? And in general, you can, you can generalize this to high dimensions if your hypothesis set uh, is VC dimensions, uh, is hyperplanes in RD, the VC dimension is D plus one. And, and so in general, the VC dimension is a measure of complexity for the hypothesis set. Okay, so what is known about uh, this, uh, this setup, this prediction model? So empirical risk minimization is perhaps the simplest possible algorithm you can think of. Uh, and, and what it does is just, uh, whenever you get a training set, you just find a hypothesis in your hypothesis set that correctly labels all the training data points. Oh, this should have been an XI. So it correctly labels every single point in your training set. So basically when you get a training data set, you pick a prediction algorithm that gets all the labels correct on your training data. And of course this exists because in this realizable setup that we are studying, we promised that the labeling function, the true labeling function H star is in H, right? So in particular, that function correctly labels everything, but there might be more such functions and you just pick one of them. And the error of empirical risk minimization is very well understood, has been so for a long time. And it was shown a, a while ago that the expected error of empirical risk minimization is bounded by order D over N times log N over D, right? And in fact, this bound is tight. This lower bound, there's several lower bounds uh, working towards establishing this fact. And one of them says that in general, this lower bound holds for any so-called proper learning algorithm, meaning any algorithm that outputs a hypothesis from our um, prediction algorithm from this hypothesis set H, right? You could also say, what if uh, my learning algorithm is out output something that's not in the hypothesis set. So we can output a general uh, 
prediction algorithm. And then the only lower bound for so-called improper learning algorithms is omega d over n, right? So there's this gap of this log in OD factor between the two. Right. And, and this gap has also been closed. There are a bunch of algorithms known at the moment that closes this gap. So the first uh, such algorithm is the one inclusion graph algorithm. So let me just highlight what it does here. So it dates back to 1994. And so when you, let's say you get a training data set uh, that looks like this, uh, four training points, and you want to make a prediction on a new data point X. So what do you do? First, you build the so-called rejection graph on your set of training points S and your uh, new uh, point you need to make a prediction on x. So this looks something like this. So in this graph, you basically have a node for every possible way that your hypothesis at h can label the points uh, in s and your new point x. So, they all, so these are all the possible labelings that your h can generate. Now you add these edges to the graph, and these edges are between any two nodes where the Hamming distance, meaning the number of uh, data points where they disagree in the labeling is just one. So they can see here that all of these points, they disagree in just the labeling of a single point. For instance, this one disagrees in the labeling of the last two points. Okay. Now what they, what they do is they uh, direct all these edges of this graph, minimizing the maximum out degree. Okay. So this could look something like this. And so now there's direction on every edge minimizing every uh, the maximum out degree. And now when you need to make a prediction now on your new data point X, what you do is you find the nodes, if there are two, or the single node, if there's only one, that is consistent with the labels you saw in the training data set, right? So here you saw the labels one, zero, zero, one. And so, so let's have a look. So in general, there are two nodes in this graph that are consistent with these labels, one, zero, zero, one. And these two, disagree on the labeling of the point X. And now what their uh, algorithm is doing is basically you say, when you need to make a prediction now for the label of X, you're going to predict uh, the in the edge direction, right? So this edge between them points to the node uh, where the label is zero on X. And so this is what you choose to predict. You predict the zero. And then you can argue that minimizing this max out degree minimizes the expected error, but we will not do so here. But the, in general, you can show that this algorithm obtains the maximum error of D over N, or the minimum error of D over N. So it gives an optimal error. Right. Okay. Then there's another algorithm by Steve Hanneken in 2016 that is based on a particular subsampling procedure. So let's say you have your training data set S. So this is the first argument to the subsampling procedure. It's shown in green up here. And he has this recursive procedure that outputs a whole bunch of subsets of this training data set. We have a base case, uh, which we're not in yet, where we just if you have at most three data points left, you output uh, the union of this S and this T that we haven't said what is yet. Otherwise, you split your data set into four pieces of equal size. And so in this case here, we split our training data set into four pieces. And now we're going to do three recursive calls and in each of these recursive calls, uh, the new S, the new training set, is only the first chunk here. And then you add two of the remaining three chunks to T. So it's going to do a recursive call that looks like this. It's going to do a recursive call that looks like this. And a recursive call that looks like this. Now, if we look again at this, the first recursive call, we're still not at the base case. There's still four data points left. So we split them into four and we do three recursive calls where we add two of the three pieces here to T, right? So we get all of these recursive calls. And finally, we're in the base case now, the size of S is less than three and we're gonna output this pink subset of the original training data, right? So each of these squares is just a training data point. And we're gonna output all of these different training samples. So these are subsets of the training data set, right? To combine them all from all these recursive calls, we get all of these many different pink subsets of the original training data set, right? So what does uh, Steve Hanneke's algorithm then do? Given all of these subsets, his learning algorithm, basically you, you have all these sets as one to as nine in this case, and his learning algorithm is, let's output the majority vote amongst and ERM trained on each of these subsets. So remember ERM just uh, searches for something in the hypothesis set that gets all the labels correct. 
It's what you only run them on these subsamples, and then you do a majority vote between all of their predictions. Right? So that is his uh, learning algorithm. Right? And this is far from trivial, but you could also show that uh, the error of this learning algorithm that Steve has, uh, has designed here is also the optimal D over N. But there are quite a lot of these subsamples here. Uh, if you work out the math, it'll be about into the 0.79 many subsamples. Okay. Let me show you one more example of an optimal algorithm. Uh, it's this basically bagging by Breiman from 1996, but the proof is, is mine from uh, last year. So what you could also do is I have a training data set S. Now I'm going to do log S rounds of sampling uh, with replacement from S. So what I do is I sample a subset SI of size, uh, the train data set half, so size of S half, and with replacement. So basically I have my data set here. I'm going to sample this one by just picking points at random with replacement so I can get multiple copies of the same data point. And I sample a set of sizes half. I repeat log S times. And now when I have these log S many subsamples uh, sampled with replacement, similarly to Steve Hennig's algorithm, uh, you run empirical risk minimization on each of these pink subsets. And your final prediction algorithm is just a majority vote amongst the predictions that these uh, log S many uh, produce. You can show also that this algorithm has an expected error of D over N. Good. So, so by now we have uh, three different algorithms, the one inclusion graph algorithm. The negative thing is that you have to build this whole graph on predictions, right? So this may be really large. If your hypothesis has BC dimension uh, D, the graph might have size about N to the D. This Hennig's algorithm, you have to do this subsampling routine in particular. You have to train about N to the 0.79 many ERMs. And also when you need to make new predictions, you have to ask into the 0.79 many ERMs on what their prediction is. So this is somewhat time consuming. I know this is the bagging of mine. You have to do the bagging subroutine. So you get like this logarithmic overhead as well. Uh, you have to query logarithmically many ERMs. So it's, of course, this is much better than a Hennig's algorithm, but you know maybe this log n is, is still a little unsatisfactory. So the question we ask in, in this work is really, what is the simplest optimal algorithm in this prediction model? So the algorithm we propose is a simple majority of three algorithms. So what do we do? It's basically the easiest or simplest you can imagine. Take your trading data set S, partition it into three pieces, disjoint pieces of equal size, call them S1, S2, S3, and run empirical risk minimization on each of them and output a majority vote. All right, so it's uh, basically the simplest you can imagine, right? Because we know from previous lower bounds that any optimal algorithm has to be improper, so it cannot just output something from the hypothesis class. If you want to do something that's improper, well, a majority of three is basically the easiest you can imagine, right? Because majority of two is not really defined if they disagree. So majority of three is, is really the simplest imaginable. No overlap, just disjoint pieces of equal size. That's it, right? So our main result is that this simple algorithm also has an expected error of order D over N, right? So I'll spend the last bit of the of this uh, video just highlighting the proof ideas, right? And even maybe you, even the album is much much simpler than before. The proof is actually also much simpler, right? So so what do we what do we observe? So the first key observation or simple observation is that um, well, if the majority errs, so if I have trained three ERMs, for the majority to err. There has to be two of the of the ones of the symbol ERMs that err, right? So if this is my input, this is the whole input domain X. There are some labels on every element of the input domain. This is the correct labels. And now if I look at the labels assigned by the three ERMs trained on S1, S2, and S3, if they assign labels like this, then for me to err, uh, two of the three have to be wrong. Right, so this is what happens in these uh, four columns, right? So two out of the three has to err for the majority to err. This is a super simple observation. Okay. Furthermore, right, these prediction algorithms that I output H sub SIs, they are IID, right? So they have the same distribution, the prediction algorithm output. Why is this? Because each of them gets a training data set of the exact same size, 
each of the training samples are IID from the same distribution. And I'm running this, if I run the same ERM algorithm, the distribution of the prediction algorithm that I'm outputting is also the same, right? So they are IID, which is very uh, neat. So what can I do now? So let's try and, and bound the expected error of this majority vote. Okay, so this is just the expected error over training data set of size n of the error of this majority vote. So what is it defined as? Well, just if we plug in the definition of the error, the definition of the error is just the expectation or fresh data point of this indicator random variable that takes the value one if my majority vote is wrong. Now, what do I do here? Basically what I observe is again, that at least two of the three has to have to err. And well, how many choices are there for which two out of the three that errs? Well, either is one and is two error, is one and is three errors, or is two and is three errors. Okay. Because the IID, the chance that is one and is two error, or is one and is three error, or is two and is three error is the same. So basically, what I have here by a union bound is that the that the expected error is at most three times the expected error of basically or the expectation or just picking as one and as two. So pick the first two one and that they both err on a fresh X. Okay, so basically what I'm saying is for the majority to err, two out of the three have to err. There are three choices of which two it could be. And so the expected error is at most three times and they have the same distribution, all these ERMs. So the expected error is at most three times the expectation or just as one and as two of the expectation or the probability that both of S1 and S2 mispredict the label. Okay, so, so this is really what I have to worry about. Now, what do I do to this expression? I just swap the order of expectation. So we move the expectation over X outside and now we have the expectation over S1 and S2 inside. Okay, so just swapping the order of expectations. And what do I get here? So let's try and have a look. So what is this saying, right? It's the expectation over S1 and S2 that both of S1 and S2, so the indicator for both S1 and S2 getting the label wrong. Now, again, these uh, hypotheses that I train on these, these it's of his eyes, they are IID. That's the independent, same distribution. So the probability that they both err is the product of the probabilities. So you can basically split this expectation into a product of expectations, where the first one is the expectation over S1, that uh, S1 gets the label wrong, that the hypothesis I train on S1 gets the label wrong, times the expectation over S2 of the indicator for uh, the ERM I train on is two, getting the label wrong. Nice, okay. Now, again, these two, because these hypotheses or ERMs are IID, these two probabilities are the same. So it's this is just the square of the first probability. Okay, so what I have now is that the expected error of this majority vote is at most three times the expectation over a fresh data point X, the expectation over uh, the training set is one. The square, or the square of the expectation uh, that the first uh, hypothesis, the one I train on, is one, gets the label wrong. Okay, so this is this is basically what I concluded so far. So, so somehow the and this is really the in some sense the error probability of S one, except we we swapped X and S one, the order of expectations here. Okay, so now we have to figure out how can we analyze something like this. Okay, so let's try, and so it's the expectation over an X, so let's try to fix an X in the input domain. So let's have a look at this particular X. Now, let us just define here uh, PX, so which is just the value of this expectation. So it's the probability over S1 that the hypothesis that you get from ERM on S1 gets the label wrong on X. And so this is P of X. So P of X is just the probability for each and every one of these hypotheses I train that it misclassifies this data point X, right? So, so this is the probability of misclassifying X when I run ERM on a data set of size N over three, okay? So then we can just plug this in up here, right? Because this is 
basically px squared, or it's exactly px squared. So now we know that the expected error is three times the expectation over x of px squared. Okay. So the last idea now, or the key idea is, let us try to partition the input domain into different sets, ri, depending on how often this ERM that I train, a single ERM, misclassifies the data point X. Okay, so I'm gonna let RI consist of all points of the input domain where one of these ERMs errs with probability in the range two to the minus I to two to the minus I plus one. So in some sense, right, or, or if you think about it, R1 is basically the set of points in the input domain where our ERM often fails, right, almost all the time. R2 is where they err a little less. So the error lies between uh, well, a quarter and a half. And R3, again, they err less than before and so on. So basically we just partition the input domain into regions depending on how often does ERM fail on a data point in this region. Okay. So then we can basically split our error this uh, expectation over x, px squared, is basically into the sum here. So a sum from one to infinity, so a sum over all the different ranges r. And then I look at what is the probability that x falls inside this range. And, if it, and then times the expectation of px squared conditioned on x lying in this range. So I write it like this. This is a conditional distribution of p conditioned on ri. So I just write it out into where does which of these regions does X fall into, okay? What is the nice part about this rewriting? Well, this rewriting allows us to, if we now look at this first portion here, this expectation, if I condition on X actually landing inside Ri, then I know exactly that Px lies in the range two to the minus I to two to the minus I plus one. So I can upper bound px by two to the minus i plus one for every single x here, and then I square it. So then this is upper bounded by two to the minus two i plus two, right? So, so this is just, this is what this uh, partitioning into ris gives us is that we now have control over uh, how often do you do you error? What's the value of this px when I'm inside this range ri, right? Because then I, there's basically, I can handle the squaring quite well. I know what it basically gives. Okay, good. So, so this is what we have to bound now. So basically the only thing that remains now to give an upper bound on the expected error is to figure out what is the probability that my sample lands in Ri. Okay. So I just now moved the things a little bit up here. Ri is a set of samples X where Px lies in the range two to the minus I to two to the minus I plus one. Px is just the probability over training one of these ERMs that you misclassify the concrete point X. Okay, so let's try to prove that the probability of being in Ri is small. Now, in, intuitively, right, uh, Ri is the red Ri here, R1, is such that you that your overall ERM often errors in here. Every single point in this uh, region, your ERM often errors. So you want to argue that this region has to be small. Okay, so why is this? So first of all, how many training samples do we expect to see from this region? Well, we expect to see exactly, well, the size of this one, this is what we care about, right? This is n over three times the probability of lying in this region. This is the number of training samples we expect to see from this range when we're training uh, this uh, this h sub s1. Okay, so, so this, is, this is how many samples we expect to see from here. Now, we're in the realizable case. So this is important here, remembering this means that we run ERM and we find a hypothesis that correctly labels every single training point in its input data set. So it correctly labels everything in S1, which means in particular, it also correctly labels everything from S1 that also lies in Ri. Okay, so it's correct on all these NI data points. And now basically we can use these old results uh, on ERM showing that if you look into the details, it basically says that every single ERM that correctly labels all the data points uh, in this region also has an error of d over n times log n over d. Now, the only twist is that we don't have n data points from within 
Ri, we have uh, Ni. And so what we what we have here is that the expected error under the conditional distribution of senior sample from Ri is exactly, we can plug into the normal ERM bound, but where we use that the number of samples is only Ni and not N. Okay, so our expected error under this conditional distribution is order D over Ni times log Ni over D. Okay. But on the other hand, and this is a second nice twist, is that we also know that this error here, by the way we defined our regions, again, Ri is a set of Xs so that the probability that you err on this X lies between two to the minus I and two to the minus I plus one. So we also know that this error is lower bounded by two to the minus I. Okay, and now we have a general inequality that, that we can use. So we now have a lower bound and an upper bound on, on this error. And combining them, we, we now have, well, our Ni was the probability that X falls in the region Ri times N over three. So if we plug that in in place of Ni and look at what inequality we get, then we get three C D over probability of lying in Ri times N times log of the inverse of this has to be at least two to the minus I. So basically we just combine these two inequalities and insert our value of Ni. Okay. What does this inequality gives us? give us? Well, it's a little bit cumbersome to work with, but I think the easiest way to see what it solves to, uh, what, it, what it gives us is it tries to let uh, Y be the value N times well, the probability that X is in R, Ri divided by 3D. Okay, because then the left-hand side here is C times log Y divided by Y. That's what we get on the left-hand side. And this has to be at least two to the minus I. If you think about it, this means that Y has to be order two to the I times I. Why? Because if we insert this Y in here, I guess the log up here basically becomes I. And this has to be, this is killed by two to the I times I. So the I's cancel out. And then we have a two to the two to the I here, which is, is what you get. So basically this means that, that Y will be two to the order two to the I times I for this inequality to be satisfied. Okay. And if we plug that in, in place of Y in the topmost equality here and solve for the probability of X being in Ri, we basically remove the 3D and n to the other side, and we get the probability that x is in our i is order two to the i times i times d divided by n. Okay, so it's basically because so basically what we're using here is that inside the region r i we error often, but if we see a lot of training samples from this region, meaning that the region is likely, then we know by classic ERM bounds that our error in this region has to be small, and so this puts a cap on how many data points we can see from r i. So the probability of X being in Ri is ordered two to the I times I times D over N. So this is what we have here. This probability that we just bounded was ordered two to the I times I times D over N. And if we insert that into the sum, we now have two to the I times I times D over N. But the first, term that we have here is two to the minus two i, and this kills both the two to the i and the i, and the whole sum is just order d over n. Nice. So really, what we're really using this proof is that this term, this two to the minus two i, came from squaring the px's, right? This pro the px's, the probability of erring in this region, were basically two to the minus i. Two to the minus i had not been enough to kill the two to the i times i. But when we square it, we get two to the minus two i, and this kills the two to the i and the i, and we get the, the right expectation. Right. So, so basically, uh, the conclusion of all of our work is that what you can do to get, get an optimal algorithm in this prediction model is just to take your data set, partition it into three disjoint equal sized pieces, and run ERM on each, and output a majority vote on your three ERMs. The error that you get is the optimal order D over N from this approach. And let me just conclude with some 
uh, directions for future research. And so in particular, a natural thing to look at is the high probability regime. So what do we mean here? So let's say that I want not just the expected error is D or N, but I want to say with high probability, meaning with probability one minus delta over the training set S, my error is at most uh, something. Then the bound that we managed to prove is with probability one minus delta over training data set, the error of our hypothesis satisfies this bound. Order, there's the D over N from before, and then there's a double log, so log of log, of the minimum of N over D and one over delta, and then plus this one or n log one or delta term. The good question is, can this be improved? So in particular, this is what we would call a pack learning bound. And the if you stare at this kind of unwieldy formula, the only thing that's not optimal in this bound is this log log term here. The log log of the minimum of n over d and one over delta. All right, so it's very, very, very close to optimal. At least this is what we can prove. But can you prove... Uh, that majority of three is actually optimal. So it's just D over N plus one over N log one over delta in this high probability regime. I think it's a really excellent open problem. Yeah, so that's all. Thanks a lot for listening.